champion. Let's welcome him to the stage. Thanks, guys. Okay. Is the mic on? Okay, here we go. Yes, sir. All right, here we are. So usually I do this like on the internet, and you know, I'm, I have a webcam above me, so it's probably a surprise to everybody that I'm six foot six. I'm usually pretty short there, right on the screen. So uh, that's that's the biggest thing I'm getting in so far. But we're going to do this presentation. Risk happens fast. Um, first of all, thanks for having me, Benzinga, Jonah Lupton. Uh, it was great to meet a lot of my members, of course, and we have some here today. And originally, I was set for Friday, so. We, we switched it to Saturday and I had a member fly in just to see me on Friday. That meant a lot to me. She flew out right after seeing me at cocktail hour. So that, that was great. And uh, a little bit about myself. I'm an MBA in finance, uh, serial entrepreneur, US investing champion, uh, founder of Champion Team Trading. So, I mean, I just love swing trading. So I do this all the time. It's, uh, you know, I rarely get a break. I'm always, always looking through charts and trying to improve the methods and stuff like that and teach it. So one of the funny things about my positions right now is I'm actually short MGM, so they own the Aria, so sorry. Don't cut my mic, don't do it. <laughs> I swear I'll cover soon and we'll get over it, but we'll show a slide on that too, which is kind of fun later. We'll get into some good stuff. Uh, I'm kind of like, I think of myself as a very aggressive breakout swing trader. Absolutely love it. Uh, William O'Neill's kind of the primary inspiration, this, the overall style, and more, you know, and I'm inspired also by you know, Minervini, Dan Zanger, uh, other trend followers like Weinstein, uh, and on and on and on. So, and we're in person, so come see me after. I'm, you know, we'll, we'll make some memories, talk a little bit. Uh, let's see what else we got here. And uh, we're going to go to lunch, so some, come meet me there, I guess, and we'll see what happens. So, Peloton, this is uh, kind of like LunaCoin, right? So, this is risk happens really fast, but, you know, this is what is this, a monthly chart or something, but. I think this is went to twelve dollars. Okay, so the the more I follow kind of long term growth investors, yeah, you know, the more I notice them, the best of them kind of evolve into swing traders, or at least at least putting some rules down. So we don't want to give back these kind of gains. I mean, this this is a uh, you know when things are really easy and then they get difficult and they roll over, and you got to have some kind of sell discipline. Otherwise, you end up in Luna Coin, right? I mean, just because it's crypto doesn't mean you shouldn't risk manage. I mean, it's all risk assets. So. Um, you know, that's, that, that's the main thing that, that, that I started doing. The more my account grew, the more I couldn't afford to give it all back because I'm not going back to, you know, start over. That, that's, that's the main thing. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, in a bear market, he who loses the least wins. Because so, you don't want to give back all this action you got if, you, if you're trading something like this. You want to take this and compound it into other winners and, uh, you know, new IPOs. We've got the life cycle trade people here. I just saw how you do it. <laughs> Read that book, by the way. It's a great book. Uh, so, you know, tra trading is simple, but it's not easy. You know, and it's a lot of work to, to, do, to do the work, to do the risk management. A lot of stocks check back, and 80% uh, of the stocks drop 50% during a bear market. That's like an O'Neill stat. Um, you know, capital gains don't belong to the house, like, like in Vegas, you know what I mean? You, just, you don't want to gamble those. Um, and some of these stocks just never come back, no matter how great they are. And this, you know, Peloton, as much as you like the bike or whatever, there, there's always another bike around the corner, right? Maybe, you know, so it's the same thing with any other app payment system, you know, Square, PayPal. Uh, what did Larry Ellison say once? His, his cat wrote someone, one of these programs or something. So you, you got to be careful to not fall in love with one of these stocks. So risk management. And this is some of the basics. We're going to get into some better stuff later, trust me. So bear with me here. Uh, okay, so... This is uh, when I won the USIC. Uh, in the beginning of the year, uh, you know, I was up right away like 15% in the first month, and I said, oh, I'm gonna, definitely going to win this. And then all year it got real choppy, but it, it, was, it set up enough with, with the breath to make some decent bases so that by come October, kind of the, uh, the stocks above the 200-day moving average, and uh, you know, they, they kind of went together with, with the price of the, the index. And then that's kind of the best environments, when, this kind of, when they move together. And that's when you can attack, uh, you know, heavily, get heavily invested. And if you're having trouble in the, in the medium term, you've got to be smaller. So it's just a little clue about, you know, when I won that. So uh, the other thing is divergence. You've you got to be careful when you get this, when you get these negative divergences. You got, on, on this slide, you're seeing the price rise into, um, you know, these sell-offs. But before the sell-offs, you have 
uh, breath deteriorating, the stock's above the 200-day moving average in the NASDAQ, they start falling apart. Then you start having these slimmer environments and there's just less stocks to choose from and you get sucked in by, say, uh, NVIDIA, or one of these large, larger caps that are kind of holding up the index. And you say, oh, well, I should have bought Tesla that rip, but basically everything else is kind of rolling over under the surface, as you can see. And then you have, eventually, the, the index catches up to the kind of the, the health of the market like that. So, all right. All right, so we're going to get into my process. Obviously, it's pre-trade, risk on, post-trade. We're going to think about all this stuff. These are the three sections, okay? So some of the basics, then we're going to get on to the good stuff, okay? So uh, the pre-trade. Preparation for uh, tomorrow's trading session begins at today's close. Okay, but not today because we're in Vegas, so make sure that's Monday uh, or, or Sunday night. The more you work, uh, you, the more work you put in, the less thinking you're going to have to do at the open. So uh, that's that's important. It's got to be a little more automatic than you would think. So, uh, it's basically impossible to know what will happen. So you, you have to be prepared for all different scenarios, uh, so so you can execute it correctly. Okay, so. You can't control what the market will do on any day, of course, but the more time you put in, the luckier you're going to get. So it's not about being lucky. It's about putting the time in. It's tra trading is like solving a puzzle. You've got to put all the pieces together, look at all the indicators, look at the stocks, and primarily the stocks are my key indicator to see what's setting up and if lots of stocks are setting up. If they're not, forget it. So uh, I, I do three simple categories, red, green, yellow, uh, with some basic kind of suggest suggestion rules here, right? So. If I'm on green, I'm 50% or more invested, risk-seeking, slower to move the stop, slower to take profit scales. Uh, but you know, ideally, I want to be all the way on margin, so we have to get to that level somehow. Uh, you know, yellow signal is a little more selective, and you can do a combination of both, kind of at different tops. You can use more tight risk management and, and kind of switch those around. So when things are tricky, you got to stay on what I call red signal, and you're quicker to take some profits and take some off the table and move your stops to even. So. Uh, okay, so let's see, let's get the next slide here. Yeah, the universe breadth, I kind of went over this a little bit already, but define your universe. Okay, so uh, the number of stocks and kind of in the uptrend is key. I mean, I want to trade small caps and mid caps because, you know, when, the, when those are set up, you can really get those quick pops and sell those into strength and kind of flip in and out of them. Um, so you got to define your universe and say, you know, I'm not going to trade utility stocks or something like that because those are slow moving and boring. Uh, track the number of stocks in your uptrend. Okay, you got to find your up, what, you, what you think is an uptrend and you know, all the moving averages you know, sloping up together, that, that's definitely the key and you want to have those stocks, count them. And when the counts are improving, that's the overall breadth is improving. And you, know, you can do this in, uh, Market Smith has these, uh, the Minervini trend templates, if you, if you have that, the one in five month, you can keep count of those and that's kind of easy to keep on a spreadsheet, just make a note and you can see if they're going up or down. Um, the percentage of stocks in the NASDAQ over the 200-day moving average, see if that percentage is changing or, or uh, declining or, or rising. So, Okay, so sentiment is another thing. Let's get into this. Uh, name exposure. Uh, base, in a nutshell, I mean, basically this shows like who's left to buy or sell. Okay, so if everybody's invested, you know, you're, you're possibly at a top. Okay, because you have to have someone else buying the stocks to kind of bid them up. Uh, you know, and, and at the lows, if, if, no, if no one's invested, there's no one left to sell, maybe. It's kind of the basic thing to think about. So these are kind of contrarian indicators, and these are reported each week. So and it's the name exposure and index. So, so this relative strength uh, chart here kind of shows large cap growth versus value. And sometimes you can switch into large cap growth, like, uh, you know, in 2020, that was kind of the first to start moving there. Uh, it, it kind of is a signal when you start having the ratio improve to the growth side you're, you're in a good environment. When it's kind of going upper left to lower right like it is now, you're having a pretty lousy growth environment. You don't want to, you don't want to be involved with that too heavily. You're going to be in select groups, select stocks. So, uh, okay. And uh, so, okay. so recent trade. So this isn't my equity curve, but this is something to think about. It's from TraderSync, actually. Um, you know, I pay attention to recent feedback on your profit and loss. I mean, you see how you're doing. See, you know, is your profit and loss, is it increasing? And then that's when you're pressing it, you know, and you got to be careful not to press too hard and be too late about it also, because sometimes on big moves, you know, people wait for too much confirmation and then they buy and then they get sold to. So you kind of want to think about some stuff like that. 
Uh, you want to see if you're getting traction or not, if your stops are getting hit. Uh, you know, if you're out of sync with the market, you got to dial it back. I mean, you can see on that chart in the beginning, um, that looks like an equity curve that's kind of out of sync with the market. And then as it starts to, you know, starts to rise, uh, they start to press into some kind of a strength, but then it kind of rolled over and then, and then that's when you should, you know, fully press it when you have that sweet curve up in the, you know, at the end of that one there. So, um, at the end of the 2020 run, I was noting that I was, I was on green signal sizing, but towards the end of the run, you can kind of use tighter risk management because you don't want to give it all back. I mean, that's kind of one of the most important things. Uh, and great runs don't last forever. So, you know, you don't, you don't want to press right, right at the, into the top of that. So, all right. So let's talk about some scanning. Okay. When you define the market's condition, the next step in my process is scanning and reviewing the charts, obviously. And, you know, the most important thing is to find a leader. If you're not finding a leader and you're just finding some, uh, a pattern, you know, and just because you found it in a textbook, uh, a lot of these things, the average daily range of the stocks are slow. You got to focus on leaders that move fast if you want to make some real big money in the, in, in, in the market. So that's one of the things to look for. You got to have the sound basis, of course. Um, let's see. You want to look for industry groups that have been rather weak, but there's several stocks setting up great buy points. And then, you know, when there's a turn, if there is a turn, you want to be in those stocks that are setting up. And, you know, this kind of recently happened in, in March. Uh, some biotech names, I think it was VRTX and REGN. It's off the top of my head. Those, they were kind of setting up when we were very oversold condition. And as soon as you get, as soon as you turn, you know, 1% of the market, those, those are breaking out. So uh, timing is also important. So, you know, how have the recent breakouts acted? Uh, you know, how's the group, you know, what, what are the buy points that look right? So it's not about just buying the patterns, like what patterns are working currently. That's kind of something that most people don't track. So, you know, I, I look for, I'm going to get into pivot resets, but I start counting those. Say, okay, that one worked. How many days was it? And then you start to kind of track like an average of what's working. And have like a picture of kind of how the money's moving in and out of these stocks. Um, lastly, I kind of avoid opening positions too close to earnings, you know, like three days or less, because a lot of these patterns are created by earnings. So you're, you're basically uh, assuming you're going to get some kind of a pop when the, the pattern is probably created by earnings, people waiting for confirmation to see what happens. So, uh, you know, there's no reason to drive yourself crazy and get, you know, too many right into earnings, and it's just a gamble then at that point. Um, it's a coin flip. Sometimes the earnings are, are, they look good and they sell off, and sometimes they look bad and they buy it, so you just never know. Uh, okay, so the, the, the five chart patterns that I primarily trade are high tight flags. And everybody thinks, I, I got this question a lot, do you only trade high tight flags? Uh, well, no, because I mean, that'd be, there'd be no trading for most of the year, really. So, <laughs> I mean, you're waiting, these, these are rare patterns, so when you finally get them working, then I'll press them pretty seriously. Uh, right now, there's a few that are setting up in, you know, coal and, and oxy, and I've traded those for a few, uh, a, a few dollars. But you know, there's we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. But you know, there's nothing new about a lot of these stocks. There's no end in can slim in those. And I'll, I'll show that. But yeah, the rocket base and all this. We're gonna get to that. But mostly like cup and handle VCP type of action. We're looking for that within these types of setups here. And uh, the main characteristic that I look for is a declining average true range, and it's called ATR. And uh, declining ATR is a sign of uh, kind of price acceptance. Things are getting quiet throughout the base, moving into the right side of, of the base and towards your buy point. Uh, most great patterns have this characteristic. Uh, you know, after the, after the breakout, the ATR will rise and I don't use it anymore. I'm just, just trying to capture that buy point perfectly. Uh, yeah, tight, a definitely tight price range is what you want on your bases. Uh, you want that, that RS line increasing into your breakout point. That's absolutely necessary. I mean, you got to see that versus the S&P. Uh, look for that on the right side of the base. Okay, so we're going to go into the high tight flags, and this is what everybody loves. So, so this one, I mean, I'm going to look at this one. It's, this is very aggressive. It's kind of funny because, you know, we could trade those, uh, you know, 2020 and the beginning of 2021. These work, but the, the tightness on the right side was terrible, but, but these patterns were working at the time. And these are 100% moves in a few days. So 
Um, that was the, the funny money time, and that was a lot of fun. As you see, or get one of those. Yeah, so you get up there, you get 100% move. That tends to slow things down. A lot of people will sell into that. So uh, let's see some other ones here. So this is AMR. Um, you know, recently, we're kind of in this rare environment where all these commodity stocks are setting up high tight flags. And, you know, they tend to throw back a lot more. It's, I think buyers are a little unsure of, you know, is this going to go another 100% or not? So you're going to get a lot of check back on these. And uh, you, you got to buy them right, though. And these do have the tightness throughout and the right buy points, but they check back. And let's see. So CTIC is one that everybody was watching recently. And I don't trade anything under $5. So I uh, kind of passed on this one. Kind of no earnings biotech. Uh, threw back to the buy point, And it's kind of difficult environment for that one. It's basically a risk-off environment, and you have you know, stocks imploding everywhere. But these live in their own universe, and they can work even in bear markets. But uh, you have to know when they're working and be honest about it, not just attack these all the time. So yeah, FLGT, another one of these kind of aggressive uh, buy points there. Uh, LNTH, this is kind of a, a recent one. Uh, bought that, sold some into strength there to see if it would keep, you know, could keep going, of course, and sold off into earnings. And I think it's already back to the, uh, the buy point again. So this type of environment we're in, you got to recognize that. And when you don't have any cushion going into earnings, it's just a gamble. You might as well just buy it right before earnings if you're going to do that. So, All right. so FUV, okay, so we're going to go when to sell. Some sell notes on these charts. I mean, this is the 100% move. It's an old trend following trick is to kind of sell when you make it 100%. So that's why I, that's why I think high tight flags require that 100% move. So you'll have a, a fund and they say, well, I made 100% uh, from where I bought it, say the 200-day moving average or something. And now you have your high tight flag because they just sold it and stopped the price from going higher. Now it can kind of digest and you have uh, your, your next buy point or it fails like this. And this is just, I remember trading this one and I actually sold it right at, very close to the peak. You're not going to get a lot of that. So don't think that's going to happen every time. And I sold some along the way, of course, but I think this is a five person electric vehicle company or something. That's back then you could trade those. So not anymore, but okay. So which one was, so not high tight flag. So this is kind of important too. Um, you know, they get some of the technical measurements, right? Most traders, but you got to take in the big picture and there's all kinds of little nuances and high tight flags that matter. Uh, so this one is, you, it's measured as a high tight flag from where it is and looks okay. But, um, you want, you want really new highs with no supply in the pole. You don't want 50% corrections in the pole. The pole is the rise from the low to the high. And some people will say you have to measure from the, the high of the prior base, or you know, it can go slightly below. But if you have to argue too much about it, I probably want a little more time in the flag before I, before I attack that. So if you take in the full picture, to me, this is just a big base. So you got to look back a little farther, and you see that there's plenty of supply there. Uh, within the pole. So as, as, as that goes up there, you're going to have, uh, you know, buyers looking to get out. And it's really just only a, a high handle to the overall cut base, in my view. And it's, uh, you know, probably a, a steep decline and steep rise. And there's some power to it. But, you know, in this environment, that'll probably check back. So, so this one, I was watching this one uh, next for a high tight flag setup. And as it drops out, you know, it's still within range. So I call this a rocket base. Because, you know, now you have your regular base instead of a high tight flag, just you know, from, from a kind of a powerful position. Uh, and you just want to give it a little more time to kind of digest because this thing dropped out. There wasn't so much support as a high tight flag, which would stay 25% or less uh, in the flag. And if this drops out a little bit more, I just want a little more time with it. So let that kind of, you know, build out, tighten and, and break out. And in this environment, they got to be pretty perfect for for me to go that way with it. So, okay, so scanning for high tight flags, there's a lot of different criteria you can use. And uh, you can email, you know, champion team trading, admin at championteamtrading.com if you want to get this. Uh, basically, just a couple examples of what you can use here for, you know, what, what your criteria is to, you know, if you don't want to go below a certain market cap price, you can change these for, your, for yourself and, you know, use it on stock charts. I think that's free. I'm not sure. I mean, I pay for it, but. Uh, you, get side, you know, get volume, trend filters. Um, you want to see that rise, you know, at least 60%. I mean, 
a real high tide flag is 90% plus and, it, you know, so we're, we're wanting to capture the early ones too. So we want to see that, we want to see the maybe 80% rise or something in, in a few weeks. So uh, let's see, okay. All right, so in relative strength, we obviously want to do that, but you know, this uses the scooter rating. Market Smith's RS rating, I, I like 90 plus. I like real winners that are strong, that are, that are basing. Um, and, and that focuses on the stock's performance over the last 12 months compared to the stocks in the Market Smith database. So um, you can kind of have your preference and, and mine's 90 plus. So you know, you're gonna get the stronger, the stronger action that way. Um, and the number of results is an important indicator for however you're screening for yourself. You can just track this and not anything else. Uh, if you're screening and you take away the, you know, Take away the high tight flag criteria, do your own screening, see what's setting up for your universe and see if that number is increasing or decreasing as you're going. All right. So this is a little more detail on the rocket base. This is kind of a, a, a bunch of power. You know, this is right below the 50 day moving average, so it's not really the buy point there, but what I'm looking for is like about six to 10 weeks and a real powerful move. I want some digestion. I want the stock to kind of, you know, base and spread out and look for that buy point, cup and handle, VCP action, something like that. Um, and I, and I want to prefer these because of the power behind it. Um, you know, I'm not trying to rebrand the O'Neill stuff or anything. I'm just, you know, what, what do I, what, I'm, I get frustrated with, with a high tight flag that fails. So, you know, this is something that I'm, I'll switch to this. You have to give it more time after to, to get any success with something like that though, so. Uh, one of the things that I really like is earnings pivots. Um, so we're looking for entries uh, at a viable pivot or pullback as earnings are reported. And like I was saying, uh, you know, earnings create these patterns. They create VCPs. They they create cup and handles. It's a lot a lot of a lot of buyers waiting for confirmation before they push it to the next phase. Um, that that's the thinking behind it. That's why I don't want to jump in right before earnings and end up down 20%. You know, at the open, I'd rather wait for some confirmation. This one actually opened, kind of checked underneath the, the, the prior bar and turned up, and that would be the buy point on this one. It, you know, and this one fizzled out, but it's just a recent example. Uh, I didn't trade it, but we're looking at this. I didn't take this because I made a mistake myself. I was looking at this in the pre-market. It looked like it was opening at $22. So I just said, forget it, and I looked at something else, and then this thing, you know, took off pretty nicely, so, and, and allowed a buy point, so. Okay, so OLN, this, this is one I've traded several times actually. This one has a nice big base and you know, as it gets to the end there, I'm, I'm a little bit ahead of earnings uh, as much as I'm comfortable with and it's trying to see if I can get some kind of pop out of it and some cushion, but I didn't really have any, you know, too much cushion. So I made it profitable, got out, waited for that earnings confirmation and as it turned up, to me it's like, okay, everyone in this base accepted this price and earn, earnings looked okay. So now, you know, you're going to the upside potentially uh, with the coin flip, but you know, as the price starts moving up, it's just telling me they're, that's where it's going. So we're aggressively buying this a little bit high, but, and then we're selling all, the whole thing into strength up there right away, so. So in a kind of negative environment, like we're in now, we have earning, earnings pivots going to the downside. This is the other thing that, that people probably don't think about too much, because everyone's swing trade to the long side. Uh, but I've been showing a lot of these lately and wait for earnings in a roll. So this is MGM. Um, it's kind of funny that, that they own the Aria, so I just thought I'd put this on and actually short the stock. But in the, uh, right, right here we had, let's see if I can do this. This is the other, I think this is the other earnings with the breakout watch. So I'll take it long or short, it's nothing personal against the stock. And then, you know, we'll cover this and hopefully, I'm sure this will resume its uptrend at some point. I think the numbers were quite good, but this, you know, earnings came out and it rolled below the moving average. So it just didn't seem like there was enough juice there after earnings and you know for people to bid this up so that that's a short same thing with mp this is a recent one and i shorted this and i've already covered both of them some of them but not all of it and this one you know reported earnings opens you know slightly inside the other candle and, and rolls over so this is one that i shorted too because you can get a fast move to the downside in a real negative environment uh you know you can you can have some luck with that and, and earnings kind of clarifies things and they didn't like it after earnings so it might go much lower you never know we're having these really big bounces right now. So shorts, you gotta be a little bit quicker with. And uh, if, you're, if you're not quick, you know, the 4% the, the rally we had yesterday in the NASDAQ kind of put you out of business if you, if you kind of shorten to the hole. So you gotta time the market with these a little bit better too, so. 
but I'll do a high RS and long bass, but I'll drop down into the 80s too for uh, you know longer basses. I think it's AVGO, right? Yeah, AVGO, yeah. So this one's a nice long bass, uh, set up pretty well at the end there, kind of has a little, little cheat or pivot at the end. Uh, you know, we have that, that RS divergence and pretty standard buy actually, and there's really nothing to it. It's just trying to buy a potential leader. You know, this is setting up for its, it was setting up for its next move higher. So that, that, would, that would be a buy point there. And uh, so the pullback buys. So pullback buys are kind of interesting. Um, they're best entered at the conclusion of the base of the breakout or near it, kind of on top of supply, um, on top of the base. Uh, where, where the prior trading was, rather. And I, I want to see kind of light volume at the lows. And I like to kind of fish lows in the cup and handle, right? So you get, you get in the lows in the handle there. This is a little bit of a sloppy handle. It's not my favorite look, but you get the idea. It's kind of pulled back, uh, light volume on the low, and then turned up, and then, you know, just selling it into strength as it kind of turned up there. As that group was, you know, very strong, this one just had a light pullback because you got a little too excited, a little too V-shaped off the low, so... Kind of V-shaped moves and bases, just this little off topic, off the top of my head. This, uh, they're kind of failure prone within bases. You take a look at the last moves in like Apple, Tesla. This reminds me of that, that kind of quick move up the right side of the base. You know, those will, those will tend to check back. So when you see that, that's another trick to, to kind of consider anyway, or a method. So here's another type of pullback. It's almost a, like a pivot and a pullback together. It's, you, you pull back on moving average, tighten up, and then kind of kind of turn up on some volume there. Um, you know, in, in some some kind of quasi high tight flag measurements there. So, and pullbacks they they take a little guesswork, and they don't really act like breakouts. Okay, so like pullbacks, you know, as they kind of round out, everyone expects them to just kind of like rip like a great breakout. But the timing, I mean, those kind of round out. It's a little more smooth. Okay, so that that's just the way I look at those. And you know, same same with kind of like you know taking it short. Uh, you know, they, can t they tend to drop out eventually if it's a good short, but uh, you, you shouldn't expect too much too quickly out of a, a pullback buy in either direction. All right, so let's get to, well, here's another pullback buy, right? So we had the, the low volume after the pullback. Um, you know, just a few days within the pullback are ideal. Uh, in the average true range, it, it can be a little bit elevated because maybe your pullback buy is attempting to get out of the base. So you see a little bit of movement, a little, some big bars. You just want to see the low volume on the pullback and the turn. And, uh, you know, and this is a little more of an aggressive buy you know, in, a, in a better environment. So that's a, that's a little pullback buy there. And I prefer them on top of the base, but this is kind of at the end of the base. Not too much supply over it. So, All right. A pivot reset. Okay, so pivot resets are you know kind of false breakouts, uh, you know that reset basically. It's just I just call it pivot reset. Uh, you know, so so a lot of traders try a breakout and they're stopped out and they'll give up on it. But you don't want to give up on it if it sets up perfect. This is a little aggressive and a little extended on this uh, zim, but I mean it's just a five-day pivot reset. This one's a little more textbook as you have. Uh, traders trying for a move out of, out of the, the low area there, and then, then it pulls back and sets up tight enough after a washout. So this, this is a little bit of the, the first mouse gets the, the trap, the stop, and the second mouse gets the cheese, the breakout. And that's kind of the thinking you have to have behind some trying to get in a leader, you know, a potential leader like that. So, uh, so yeah, risk on. So it's time to act. So this is your brain. And this is your brain after the opening bell. You're, you're basically scrambled because basically anything can happen, but you have to be prepared for anything. You got to be present. Um, you got to be alert and focused. You know, once you've done your homework, there's no reason to second guess yourself. It, it, you know, in doubt just hinders your success. And um, use a little imagination at the buy points before. You got to do a little rehearsal. Say, okay, what's you know, how's this going to act? And you know, if it does this or that, low volume at the buy point, am I going to buy it? Uh, you know, have a little bit of mental rehearsal, I think, too. Um, and, and learn when you're thinking negatively and try to refocus that energy. Um, and you're not, you're not paid to sit in front of the screens all day, obviously. So, uh, you know, you've got to wait for the right opportunities, and they, they always come. So, all right, when it's time to execute, don't, don't expect to have any consistency in your results if you don't have any consistency in your execution, OK? 
Okay, so you know, if, if you just trade because you know you have that time during the week on Tuesday afternoon, that's you know maybe a little bit uh, not not the right way to do it. Um, you got to think about your execution, um, and everyone tends to overcomplicate things in, in an effort to know what will happen. Everybody wants to be right, so yeah, don't don't try to be smarter than your homework. That's a good rule. Uh, and you definitely don't get smarter after the opening bell. That's what homework's all about. So, you know, intuition comes from practice. So you must really believe in what you're doing. Um, just trying to keep things simple to avoid paralysis by analysis is, is key. Uh, okay, so we want to see how the market's behaving at the open. Did it gap higher, lower? Any buyers present and in control? Okay, so that, that's key. You don't want to buy a breakout maybe with no volume in the market falling apart. It's just going to go against you perhaps. So that's just something to consider. Uh, you got to think about your industry groups. You know, which industry groups are outperforming? You know, are there any stocks on my watch list in these groups, right? So you should show up with the leaders in that group too, not just anything. A lot of people show up with the best pattern in the group, but it might be the worst stock, you know, low liquidity and not a fast mover unless something changed with the stock, you know, that's, that's key. Um, so which stocks on your watch list are experiencing, you know, high relative volume? That's what you want to see. And relative volume is that intraday ratio between the current volume and the three month uh, average, at least on Finviz, it's one to use. And I use TC2000 also, you can check that out. And you, know, you can use all kinds of other indicators that update throughout the day. And I'll show a few of those too, so. You know, light volume tends to lead to a lack of follow through and directional moves. So it's all about execution and of the stocks on the watch list, they're experiencing the highest relative volume, which are most likely to have already traded the days, already traded the days low. Okay. So um, when picking between multiple stocks, I favor those where the days open is equal to the days low. So you want them opening and the price pushing up off the low. This is kind of a, a thing not a lot of people think about, but that really shows the buyers are in control when your candlestick opens on the on the low and then just kind of rises throughout the day and through the buy point. And that's something that we use a lot. And that's actually an indicator that I have on this TC2000 that I, that I give the members. So you can see that uh, updated in real time on like on a spreadsheet, which is really nice with your watch list and all your with all your trend criteria stocks just set up automatically. So, uh, so yeah, Finviz is a good one too, but you know, the, the prep should be so good that your Vegas hangover doesn't affect your, your, your uh, trading. So you should be able to execute. You just got to be ready. So, all right. So this is the, the, the Mar Marabozo candle. I don't know if I say that right, but this is what I'm talking about. When the candle opens on the low and closes on the high, uh, this means you did your job correctly for the day, basically, if you got this one right. Uh, you probably want to sell a little bit, which I did on this, and eventually this rolled over. And it's, this is whipping all over the place now, but... Uh, making the trades lightly profitable on a red signal are kind of key, but you want to see that open on the low at the buy point and then press higher th through through the buy point, or right at the buy point. It's fine too. So, within range of about one percent or so. Uh, crypto traders might call this the moon candle. Is this what you want to see? I mean, it's not that big, but you know, we've seen we've seen better ones, 2020 anyway. So, uh, you also want to see that average true range. You want to see that coming in throughout the base, and you can see on this chart, you can see this average true range kind of coming in there right into the buy point. You have this low volume right there in a tight area. And then as I see the volume come in right off the open, I'm buying that. So, and you know, we're, we're trying to get a, a move up there, but you know, not in this environment. They're, they're checking back quite a bit. So you gotta be faster with your profits, at least for, at least for the time being, you know, take, taking your profits. All right, so scaling and trailing. This, this approach that I have is a, a little bit of a mix of art and science, okay? So, you know, the more risk you have on, the more difficult it becomes to make good risk management decisions, basically. So, you know, humans are wired to avoid stress and pain, which makes it difficult to think objectively while in a trade. Um, you gotta get comfortable being uncomfortable, and you really gotta size up and be at your biggest, right at the right buy point. If you want to really make any money, you got to get a lot of money in it. And I work on a lot of advanced ideas about trying to get in with size, uh, you know, using staggered stops and taking some off into strength and, and taking that overweight off. Or if it's going against you, you're taking that overweight off the, in the other direction, uh, you know, in, in a small way. So 
you want to take, you can take many staggered stops even to, to keep yourself in the trade and, but not, not huge. And, you know, you can also see if, if it's a one minute candle or not, you know, this, where all the volume is, you want to see the volume kind of steady throughout the day. So you got to manage your trade, not your feelings. Okay, you got to avoid being a victim of your emotions. Um, the goal is definitely to reduce the need to think while under stress. I mean, it's a lot of stress, if, especially if you're up on a green signal and things start going against you and you're giving back some money. Uh, you, you're you're going to have a lot of stress. So you got to manage that and have those expectations. And this is also primarily a level of difficulty. And then, uh, you know. It, you, you could be more heavily invested on red signal if you're catching the right groups. Say you're on all the energies and the coals and all that. But you can also risk manage them very aggressively and still stay in the trade for a bigger move. So that's just, the, it's all a personal decision. You know, I only just go over the methods and you know, present to my members and everybody, you know, some different ideas and what the situation is. Everyone has to use that uh, for their own trading. So. Uh, and it's definitely not set in stone, and these things change as things get extended. You can, you know, go from green to red while keeping your positions open and being on green size. Um, so that that just talks about where it, where it's at. Uh, if you see that, we already went over that. So, uh, you know, I've been on red signal since April fourth, and then right before that, we had some traction in you know different different industry groups that are very. We got to be very selective right now, as uh, you know, the market was very thin as I was showing the divergence and the. Uh, the breadth and the price of the indices, and now that we roll over, you only have a few that, few sectors that are holding up. So, all right, a little bit of trader math. Don't worry, there's no no quiz when I'm done with this one. But um, the expectancy is the average win times the win rate minus the average loss times the loss rate. So, um, this table provides a baseline for formulating a realistic trading strategy. It's a reality check for new traders who think trading provides a fast track for wealth. Okay, so it's possible to be profitable with a low win rate if your average winner is large enough. You can, you know, do the, go down this table and, and, and you can see where that would be um, for different levels. And, and this table assumes that trades are all the same size, of course, but my sizing will change based on the signal. Um, and, you know, stats for different signals make, you know, that, that makes sense too. So. If you're on green signal and you see all the stuff working and that's your typical signal, you know, what, what is your average winner then versus in general? Because if you just kind of lump all your trades together, it's not exactly uh, you know, talking to the current market conditions. And that goes to kind of looking back at past trades and stuff too. I always say, well, you go back and look at a chart and some breakout from two years ago, kind of like with no context, you're doing yourself a disservice. You're just looking at a textbook uh, you don't know what was going on at the time. You kind of have to rewind all the charts and the indices and what was the breadth then, and you got to kind of match it all up. If you want to study what happened at a certain time, you get, get everything, all the indicators that you use that matter to you, and study that, that trade against those you know, indicators. You see how everything was acting, how was the group acting, how were the other groups acting, stuff like that. So it's not an exact science then, obviously, if you do it like that. So it's a little bit of a... A mixture so okay so when to sell seriously guys when when do I sell I have no idea this is, it's like the, this is one of the hardest things to do just kidding uh, you know I was hoping someone can answer that for me but you know right now you don't ask too much for, of the current market conditions you know so kind of like making a trade lightly profitable is, is key sort of to take the stress down as you finally try one and you get something working um, you know, so then you can move on to other trades and see how much money you can actually get in the market and see how many trades you can get on and, and push that, that equity curve up. But without giving it back, that's the red signal. You want to move your stops to even as fast as you can at certain risk multiples. Okay, so a lot, there's a lot of ways to do it. I mean, you can look for violations, technical violations. Uh, you know, you can use moving averages. You can use the kind of 100% sell rule if, which we're not really getting right now. It's unrealistic in this environment, but that's just kind of a, a fun chart there to take a look at. I think that was actually an actual trade too, so. And yeah, once, once again, we actually go back to this. So 
you, know, you got to put yourself in the position of other traders. That's, the, that's another way to think about it, too. So if the 50-day moving average fails, most people are going to close it. So you're just going to, you know, maybe you're going to have a big downtrend all of a sudden. So you, you got to get out, and then you're not having that first slide, Peloton or a Luna coin or something like that. So, okay, so post-trade. And this is what I was talking about. Maybe I jumped ahead because I'd rather not read this and just talk, right? But this is, you know, usually I live stream and we go on forever and everybody brings up charts and we just, we work off of that. But um, this is kind of a, talking to growth traders that hopefully get some more risk management. This is kind of why I want to put this together. Uh, but studying past trades and other, other uh, trades in a book, like I said, you got to rewind all those programs and, know what signal you were on, what was the giveaway that the trade was going to work. Uh, the context, you know, it's definitely very important for the post-trade analysis. Is that Mario? What went wrong? Okay, so we would definitely want to do less of what went wrong, we, we, <laughs> of uh, bad trades rather, track your progress. Many good trades won't work. That doesn't mean you got to give up, change your style, change your plan, uh, you know, and start, you know, just buying uh, SPY calls every time something you know, goes a little lower or something like that. Um, you know, you just have to sit in cash or, or be short, obviously, you know, but trading your system, whatever that's going to be. Um, you got to accept, accept your trade and look, look for the next trade while you're risk managing. Um, accept that loss, too. And, you know, as you're taking losers, you, you're sizing down, too. This is the most important thing people don't do. Um, you know, kind of at the end of these runs, when the, like I was showing, the breath kind of started, you know, falling apart. You're not, okay, you, you might be taking some more trades, because like I was saying, NVIDIA and this kind of, you know, Tesla might suck you in or Apple could suck you in to the market and start, start trading again. But uh, as, as those roll you out, you don't want to just go bigger and bigger to re revenge trade. Then you're, you're digging a hole and your, your brokerage account is going to look like this dumpster fire here. So I definitely don't want that. So you got to learn from your mistakes. And sometimes your mistakes are just, it's not what you did technically, what you're buying. It's more of a, how you're pressing it wrong. You know, that, that, that's a real uh, analysis error that most people make. They say, okay, well, you know, those trades just didn't work. But it, in reality, you pressed too hard. That was the, the biggest problem with what, what went wrong in your trading. You were actually making good buys, but you're just looking at textbook patterns maybe and kind of not thinking of the whole picture of your equity curve and, um, you know, the win rate of the stocks and you kept pressing, thinking things were, were going to work. Um, but you got to start counting bad trades and say, okay, even the ones you, even the ones you pass on, you have to monitor those. You see, okay, these are all failing. I don't want to get involved with all these failing trades, right? So definitely track what went wrong in a, in a big way. And what went right, this is the other thing. So selling some into strength at several risk multiples is the main goal. And when, Really, I'm a trend follower. I want to I want to sell some into strength, but I want to catch bigger moves. And if it wants to trend, you know, forever, and if I do sell that into the, some big rip like that, I'm still looking for another entry back in the stock, you know, if it sets up again. But a lot of times, like I showed in 2020, a five-person EV company with worth billions of dollars is going to roll over. So you definitely have to, you know, look look for the next setup, or let it roll over without you. And a lot of times they roll over, and a lot of them's just, you know, liquidity-driven events, and, you know, all that stuff starts flying. And, uh, you know, hopefully that's happened soon, because that's what's fun to trade, you know, those types of stocks. Um, and, and what went right? So one of the things people do wrong is they're not big enough when things are working. You know, you, you really got to press it hard to have those big returns, to win a contest or really get those gains, you know, that everyone's looking for 100% plus on the year, stuff like that. You got to be huge, you know, at the right time. Uh, a famous thing where, where Soros criticized Druckenmiller was he criticized him for not going big enough when, when he thought he had a good setup, you know what I mean? So that, that's definitely something to take away. You got to press it and, and definitely being a leader. If, if, if you're going to really press it, you got to be in the right stock too. So. And that's all about the large size, and you've got to have it. You've got to learn how to manage that size at the right time. Uh, and even when you're in cash, you've got to be engaged. You've got to be studying the market. You know, the more ideas you can track, the better, which is why I have my service. We look through all the trades and log all the stocks you're watching and start to build the case for, you know, buying the next breakouts as they start setting up and, and as groups start to, you know, firm up and the market firms up. Uh, 
So there you go. So, yeah, when to sit out. So obviously swing trading against the market decline makes your odds go lower, right? So it, in this sell-off right now, the breakouts are not working great. It's in select groups, and they're all throwing back. So that's lowering your odds. A few will work, though, and that might suck in a lot of traders, and that's like a big trading error when you see one or two stocks work and everybody goes crazy for it. And sometimes those stocks are only working because that's the only thing everyone's trading. You know, if enough people buy a stock, I mean, the price goes up. So you're going to have something like that, uh, like BRCC recently. I didn't trade it, but that was like kind of a nice entry. And I think we were talking about this yesterday. Everybody kind of got, you know, excited about it, whipped up about BRCC. Uh, and that thing kind of flew and then it dumps out. So, you know, using that as a, like, a good example for risk management, it definitely sells some in the strength and you got to move your stop up. Uh, you know, even good conditions can can be tricky too. So if for some reason you're not, not making money on good conditions, you still have to pull back, right? So that's the other thing. You're just not in sync with the market. You've got to recognize that uh, for whatever reason. It could be personal. Maybe you're, you're buying the wrong stocks and you're just on a cold streak uh, and you become your own fade, right? So you don't want to do that. Uh, you check the indicators when everything is deteriorating and you can sit out. Um, and when you're not following your, your system, when you find yourself kind of trading other styles all of a sudden, that's like kind of desperate trading or whatever you call it. You know, it's just if you're trading outside your system. <laughs> I, I would say you should probably cut yourself off. <laughs> you know, that's the way to go. And when to go for it, you know, using the house as money is obviously the best way. So like if you go to blackjack tables later, you know, my play is small until I start making some, some money and then I'll start pressing that. It's kind of the same with, with stocks, of course. So, And you've got to be careful after your big gains. There will be pullbacks, so you don't want to press at the wrong time up. You know, so you got to do it with proper risk management, that's for sure. And if you're getting traction in select groups, uh, despite what the market's doing, you know, by all means, you, know, you can press that a little bit as long as you're using good risk management. I mean, that's just, you know, my methods there and what I do. So... Uh, if your stocks are trending and you're moving stops even or better and taking profit scales, things are working then. Uh, playing carefully and small until you gain experience is usually a good move. So say you want to start trading like this and say, I want to be a high tight flag expert. Everyone should definitely go for it. Uh, you know, practice small. Don't go crazy. You know, you, it, it takes a lot, of, a lot of practice, a lot of years to really get, get the timing right. And, and go through different environments to match, you know, things up correctly. So, all right. Well, thanks so much. You, you know, I don't have championteamtrading.com is kind of where I hang out and put all my trading and stuff. And everybody wants to come check that out uh, and come meet me after. And thanks for having me. And I think I'm out of time here. I don't know if anyone has any questions or anything. You want to do some of that? Got five minutes. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. For earnings pivots, could you talk about your day one trade plan, how you're, how you're entering, how you're setting yeah, stops? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'd rather do this than read slides, obviously. Uh, yeah, so the earnings pivots, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm it, this is a little bit of a fishing expedition. When you're going to do an earnings pivot, it's going to take a lot of time. You're going to do a lot of different uh, setups. You're going to have to go through a lot of earnings pivots to, to get a good one because they can gap up, they can gap down. So you're going to get it just right at the buy point. It's going to be rare, but it's worth doing, and it's worth waiting for. So you want to see it open inside or at the buy point, and then press higher, and you're buying it as it's doing that really early in the day when you see some volume. Usually there's good volume on, on earnings. So it's a good question. But yeah, hopefully I got that for you. Does that make sense? OK. All right, guys, well, definitely meet me at lunch over there. Thanks for listening. Thanks for coming out and supporting. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Hope, hopefully that was good. We'll see. All right. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for attending. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. One more time. Big round of applause. There we go. Hey. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir.